Welcome to this episode of Sunny Silver Linings. Sunny's guest today is Amara Abedi. Amara is a strategy consultant for the C-suite of Insperity's middle market clients. Amara helps the leaders build and drive their mission, vision, values, provides executive coaching, and leadership alignment to ensure the company's culture is based on their people. And now, your host, the founder and CEO of IT by Design, Mr. Sonny Kayla. Over to you, Sonny. Omar, thank you so much for joining me today as my guest. I truly, truly appreciate your time. Thank you. It's such an honor to be here. Yeah, so today we have Omara with us. Uh, she's a strategy consultant uh, for Insparity for mid-market accounts. And she has been uh, our partner, uh, IT by Design, as you know. Uh, we have been uh, Mara, using Insparity partnership for many years. And as, as, and as, as a result of this partnership, uh, it, it kind of helped us grow as a business and have that, uh, you know, scaling up effectively as a result of this partnership. And you have been working with us from a few years. And I lo- always love our conversations on leadership, on talent strategies. And I am super, super excited about having this conversation today because when we were talking about this early on, a couple of months ago before Build It, and I'm like, you know, this is something that I really want to share with the world. So thank you so much for joining me today. I'm, I'm super excited to have that conversation too. It's one of the topics that I'm very passionate about. So um, thank you for inviting me. And so let's start with, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, people that don't know Amara. Uh, so what, yeah, so can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, so I'm an organizational psychologist by trade. And in my current role as a strategy consultant for middle market consulting services at Insperity, I get to help the C-suite um, middle market clients usually to see um, what is the what is the motivation, what is the mission, vision, values behind their um, behind the work that they get to do behind the uh, foundation that they build for their organization, or it could be a diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy that they will want to include and implement in their business. It could be, um, so many different things that you, you don't even think about that a business might need or, um, and can you uh, so can you share a little bit on diversity and inclusion? Like, in, you know, when I talk to different people, their version of diversity and inclusion sometimes, uh, you know, is different. Uh, what does it mean to you? I would say so diverse. So just for a common understanding, a lot of times um, we use those terms so um, interchangeably that it's it's hard to differentiate. So when I see diversity, to me that means that a certain group is being represented, whether it's minority for, uh, from their uh, gender, sexual orientation, religious, any kind of differences that they bring to the table. So that representation, that so that's more like a number um, that 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 that's referred to as diversity. When it comes to inclusion or um, equity. Equity is more like who has that access to be, if you're uh, conducting a meeting, let's say, who all can enter the room, um, who has been invited. And then once you once that person has been invited, inclusion is, do they feel like they belong there? Do they feel like they have the right to speak their mind? Do they feel comfortable being who they are in that room? So that's kind of my perspective that, that I've um, noticed, and and I know that there are different views on on that topic. Yeah, and uh, yeah. So one thing sometimes I think about is uh, so so um, I write with my right hand, uh, Amara, and I always when I play my volleyball, I'm a big volleyball player. To tennis and anything that I play is with the left hand. Uh, and uh, the other day I was uh, uh, trying to buy my golf set, uh, a new golf set. And even there, so sometimes, you know, I have to buy the left, <laughs> left hand for, people, for left hand people. And from the door perspective as well, I'm like, no, this is not made for me. 
like, you know, I want to open that door with my left hand, but it's designed for the right hand people. And uh, so do you think like, uh, with, you know, how far you can go with diversity and inclusion? So that, that was one thing that was, yeah. uh, I was yeah. thinking about. <laughs> On that right hand, left hand, uh, my brother is, is also left-handed and that's his dominant hand. I remember throughout college, throughout high school, he would always complain because whenever uh, they're test taking, he's writing with his left hand. And so he keeps bumping his hand into the person next to him. And they get bothered, especially in an exam taking setting. That can be something, and it's such a minor thing, but but that's what it's about. It's about little things that that show you um, that how, how much care, how much acknowledgement goes into this. Yeah, and how different we all are as human beings. We're yeah. all unique, right? and uh, understanding that strength of uh, being different and embracing that and leveraging uh, diversity, those uh, complementary strengths, uh, right? So just imagine in a volleyball game, someone leveraging my left-hand strength rather than expecting right-hand mm -hmm. strength from me, right? So the yes. team is normally, uh, great teams are built keeping complementary uh, strengths that uniqueness that, yeah. and where you bring all the unique strengths and create that trademark strength uh, trademark capability of your team so let's get back get into our uh, leadership uh, conversation and the, you know what are so my first question is what are some common challenges that business owners and leaders for small tech organizations can experience when they look for leadership potential in their people. I'm glad that you said common because whatever one business is going to experience or face is going to be different um, for the other organization. But I can say the most common challenges that we usually see for small tech organizations are um, because of limited or constrained budget, they tend to have, they tend to hire or recruit um, based on who they know, business owners usually, or um, hiring professionals, they usually tap into the pool that's very limited. And um, they could be either their friends, their family, or someone they know. Also, a lot of times they're using their gut feeling to bring people in. If they talk to someone and they, they think that, oh, like that's where unconscious biases come in too, right? That we talked about. If someone went to the same school as you, if they speak similar language um, as you, or if they belong to, and it's it's so natural because we, on a psychological level, we all want to have that feeling of relatability. And once um, you see someone that, that looks a little bit like you, feels um, in a conversation that they sound like you, we use unconscious biases for that. So that, that would be one. The second one I would say is whenever you're high, you're promoting from within your organization, people tend to promote um, their, the candidates, the, the um, team members that are high performers instead of evaluating if they even have leadership potential. So just because someone is good at something that they're currently doing doesn't necessarily mean that they would be good at, um, at a higher level at the next and the third challenge that I would say is your candidate can have um, high potential. They can be high potential candidate or they can um, be a high performer. But if they're not ready to take that role yet, uh, to start leading people, then, then that's not your person. It's just like how we say in dating too. You can be the, you can be the best um, perfect match for yourself, but if they're not ready to be in a relationship or if they're not ready to take things to that next level, then they're, then that's not who you want. Yeah, it's that desire, that want. Yes. So, I mean, you, you have been, uh, so yeah, unconscious bias, right? Uh, and we all can uh, uh, face that challenge. And you have mentioned a few different concepts, but it sounds like uh, it comes down to three key uh, areas and can you share with us how they are all interconnected that performance and potential and readiness that you have uh, just discussed how they are interrelated sure so if i could give you a formula i would say based on organizational psychology principles performance um, when multiplied by potential 
is um, what gives you readiness. So in other words, readiness is a product of performance and potential. And the reason that I say it's a product and it's not a sum of performance and potential is because if you have zero performance and that gets multiplied by potential, then readiness is zero. So mm -hmm. it's it's not that one of them, one of the factors can be uh, null and you still get some, some results. So that's not the case. Performance usually, like if I were to define it, I would say performance is something that that can help you see if someone is being successful or being effective in their current role. Mm -hmm. That usually only <clears throat> predicts success in similar types of positions that they would um, they would perform in. Now, potential potential is their future capacity to be effective in a more complex and a more challenging roles because now the territory is different. Mm -hmm. Their role is 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 a little bit more complex than than it was before, and it also potential also tells you that if they're actually willing, not only if they have an ability, but if they're even willing to learn from their pre previous experiences and apply that into their into their future complex work that they get to do, and readiness being the product of performance and potential, readiness tells you if they have an ability, if they are willing, if they are ready, do they have the competencies? And also, do they have the leadership traits that are required to perform that, uh, to perform that work? Mm -hmm. so, so what I'm hearing you say is that, so there's performance component, that how are you performing in your role that you are playing today? And then uh, you have that potential, like for the next role. Right, so the mm -hmm. growth uh, path that you have, the next position that you have, the next role. So you're doing really well in the role that you are uh, playing today, and you're uh, you 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 have potential for the next position. And now the readiness is that your willingness to get to that next role. You're you know, do you want it? Do you want that role? Right? Are you ready to take that out? Are you ready to make that commitment to? To, to leverage your potential to, per, to perform now at the next level with the next role, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. today's potential will become tomorrow's performance in that. Yes, way. very well said, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so so proven value in the role that you're playing and potential value for the next role mm -hmm. and your uh, readiness to get there and so that you can start building your commitment to build that new capability that will make you a high performer at that level, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. okay. And, and the stakes can be so high, Sunny. If you think like there are organizations that I have done consulting for in the past, and I noticed that whenever they were hiring, like let's say if it's a boys group, right? If they're only hiring people that they are or promoting people that they were, um, that the manager was already friends with. And once they promoted that person, they realized that they weren't, they didn't have any leadership potential. They were performing well at that level, but once they got to that level, they couldn't perform at the same, at the same level. So either, so you only have two options at that point. You either let that person go or you keep developing them and hoping that they would get to that point. Now, Again, going back to if they're not ready for it, if there's no willingness, if there's no ability to learn from their past experiences, then there's not much that you can do at that point. That's a selection issue. That's not necessarily a training or a development um, issue at that point. So the turnover, the turn rate, all of those they start to get higher and you start to lose money. Especially if you're a small organization and like 20 to 30 people losing one leader that can impact so much the rest of the team now you've lost your high performer you've lost a leader and that's that's just a lot of money that that's being wasted for one wrong decision yeah and and i see this uh, amara uh, so many businesses making this mistake <clears throat> i see it all around me i have personally made a lot of mistakes there uh, right. So in our journey to 600 plus uh, people MSB now, uh, you know, it uh, that growth uh, normally uh, the, the comes from your 
uh, failures and learnings and uh, optimizing, transforming uh, yourself. And I see, I mean, I want to understand this piece uh, in a little bit deep, at, at, at a deeper level, because there are so many my MSP friends that I talk to, I interact with. We just had a conference and a lot of conversations on talent strategies because it is hard to find people. It's hard to retain good people. So this is a real issue and I want to take a little bit extra time here to understand this piece. Especially in the MSP world, uh, Amara, normally the, the your biggest um, people department is technology department. So your L1 engineers, your L2 engineers, your L3 engineers, your tier one, tier two, tier three engineers. And common mistake that I see MSP leaders make making is that they, they you know, if there is a L2, L3 engineers, they are so good in their performance and they see mm-hmm. that, okay, person's Willingness is there to get to the managerial level, now the leadership level. And it is common to see that a good tech may not mean good leader. And a lot of times people, because of the potential that they see, and I'm gonna come down, come back to leadership potential understanding as well, but let's, let me just kind of share the common challenge in the MSP sector is that People or leader thinking that person is really good in technical performance and that person is going to uh, be a good leader and they have willingness to do that. They want to do it, do it, but they don't end up they don't end up becoming great leaders. And that as a as a result of their leadership, a lot of other good techs leave that 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 company. And now mm-hmm. the, the the owner or the. Uh, or the leader uh, whose responsibility is to make sure that the culture is calibrated amongst all the divisions have a problem to solve. Now, you have a really committed, dedicated, loyal person where they have paid their dues for many years. And because of that, that proven value, you gave them that new opportunity and now they're failing. And to your point, now they have to make a decision. Either they need to manage them out or they need to manage them to a different role. And that becomes this complex problem to solve and it impacts that person's life, that morale, that really it's just painful. So can you Mm -hmm. help us understand, first of all, that what common mistakes that you have seen people making from the example that I shared, those type of uh, mistakes, and what what is your recommendation to, uh, to, to kind of really prevent these type of mistakes? Sure. So I think that's a that's a very common challenge, especially in the IT industry that you see. Um, I can only imagine like that investing so much money in sourcing, recruiting, hiring the best candidate, and you thought like that's a top talent. It's high, they're highly compensated, and you invest so many so many resources to now developing them as an individual contributor. To your point, Sunny. They were fantastic. They have the right te- technical skill set. They knew exactly how to perform the technical side of their job. But I would say when you are, when their manager or their leaders are observing their performance, take a look at um, ILP, individual learn uh, leadership potential. And some of the behaviors that I can give you, I think that's that's some, that's our next topic. But some of the behaviors that their manager or their leader can start observing early on in their in their performance the technical side is taken care of and they're perfect at it but also try to see like how ambitious they are how driven they are how influential they are because at that level it's not even about performing the technical side of their job sure it's good to have that technical expertise and that background so you can be a good problem solver when it comes to that technical areas but but are they able to influence other people to do their job correctly? Are they able to influence other people in a way where they're they're making decisions, they're helping them make decisions and people are in agreement with with them, right? Like, are they they leading them in a way where it's motivational, where it doesn't feel forceful, where it doesn't feel that, um, that that they're constantly being challenged? by by their team if there if there's some friction like that then again it can be something that can be worked on that 
can be developed. But if it's something that that person is just, I think a lot of it goes to self-awareness too. If, if, if you're missing emotional intelligence, if you're missing self-awareness, those are some of the things that I believe are hard to train people on because you sometimes either have those or you don't. Mm. Sure, there are trainings. Sure, um, there are tools and resources that can help with that. There are several different trainings and books on emotional intelligence. But again, that co- goes back to how much are you willing to do that and to make that change within yourself? Yeah. So, no, uh, yeah. So there's so many trainings on EQ uh, or, you know, but, you know, on some people just have that natural ability. And mm-hmm. if you put them in the same training, they're already performing here. They're going to get there. And if someone mm-hmm. is uh, their their factory installed EQ level is yeah. here, <laughs> it's, then, gonna take a lot, yeah, it's, a, it's a long way to go. And uh, yeah. while it's doable, but it's it's not very probably, you're not putting and it's that person it's going to drain so much of their energy too. Yes. If I get put in a situation where like I'm an introvert, people, if they ask me to party all day, all night long, I mean, if I have to do it, I'll do it. Right. Like, so many of our weddings are like four day, five day events. I get exhausted at the end of the day because that's not who I am. That's not (laughs) comes naturally to me. So sure. If I get put in a position like that, I will try my best to do it just because I want to do it. But at the same time, if that's not who I am, then that's not who I am. Yeah. And and so let, let me give you a, a scenario uh, where from like, you know, uh, now reflecting on uh, my leadership journey and uh, challenges that I have faced. Uh, because, you know, the biggest division we have in, hun- I mean, we have hundreds of technology professionals. And as a leader, I want to make sure I have a culture of promoting from within, you know, taking people along with me. I want to make sure that people where they have paid their dues, they have been there with us in good times and bad times. I give them opportunities to grow, create bigger future at IT by design. And in that interest, we give the opportunity to a technology professional to lead people. And that's the intent behind it. That is what we really want to do, to take people, give them those career paths so that they can grow within the organization and they don't have to look for their career uh, uh, growth somewhere else. So that is the context. That is the why behind doing it. Now, from my experience, sometimes, it, those situations were created where L2 engineer was given the technical lead role, where now they have a group of 10 to 15 other techs. And as a result, sometimes those techs leave because now you have this person. And uh, and that, that's one scenario. So if you stay with me. Now, the second scenario is that you bring in a people person uh, from where they're not tech- uh, they don't have the technology background. They have people management background. Now, some of these engineers, they don't respect this person because they all, he don't know anything, right? He don't. He cannot coach me. He cannot guide me because they, he doesn't know uh, my kind of uh, technology or my solution that I need to work every day. So these are the two scenarios. Here you have a technology background person leading people. He got he got respect from the technology point of view. That person he, uh, he's he's able to guide people uh, to to kind of you know with the projects and tickets. On the other side, you have a people person who is good in relationship building, the influence that you're talking about. But at the same time, that person is not is struggling to have that uh, respect because that person is not able to guide the, his engineers with on the technology side so what's your advice to me that what do i do in these scenarios uh, because i want both people to be i mean i want this position to be successful that's a, that's a great question and i like how real that scenario is because that is going to be some of the most common challenges that i think most organizations feel um, let me ask you a follow up question, Sunny. In in the first um, scenario, how what's the percentage if you had to if you had to break down the job description of that technical team lead? Um, how much technical work do they have to do, and how much leadership um, or people management would they have to do in their 
allocate a job? Yeah, I will say probably about 70, 30, uh, that 30 percent of the role will be technology guidance, technical guidance, okay. technical support uh, to the, okay. the, that those team members and 70 percent is everything else from the client okay. facing side and the, their leadership side. So I would say. And help me um, help me if I'm wrong. Technical skills are, I, and I understand like someone who has put in that time and commitment and grown and has grown to that level where they have earned the respect of their of their colleagues because they are they have that technical expertise. But if you are bringing someone in who who is great at um, helping people get to from point A to point B, but is missing that technical knowledge, is it, isn't that easier to train someone on? Especially if that's 30% of the job component that they would be doing on a day-to-day -day basis, rather than the people side of it, the managing, um, the leading, not even ma managing, I want to say, more yeah. like leading um, their team. Yeah, so I think it's a, it's very uh, uh, scenario-based uh, that, uh, <clears throat> so the person who is uh, non-technical, their job is 30% technical guidance, 70% is, uh, is more of leading and managing and holding the team accountable. Uh, it's, if that person's uh, overall technical aptitude is there, that they have some kind of technology like degree, computer science or mm -hmm. something that they, they get the bigger picture, then mm -hmm. I think they, they, if their commitment is there to learn, they're open, they're committed, they want to do well with that 30%, of course, it's doable. It's doable and probably easier, uh, but it's um, uh, it's um, uh, it, I mean it can be a challenge as well. Uh, where yeah, for sure. Where these engineers, where they have many many years of uh, technology working experience, mm -hmm. and they go to the person when that escalation happened, when yeah. they are not able to solve the problem. That's when they go to the subject matter expert mm -hmm. who can guide them in the right direction. So they their thirty percent needs they they got to be the master. It has to be really good for that thirty percent. I and I I see the dilemma. I see the dilemma. Neither of those are perfect, right? But if I had to pick one, I would say. I would go with with someone um, who is more on the people side. If you are thinking of them for a leadership position, more on the people side. Um, the, um, and even if there are thirty percent of uh, technical skill, technical expertise isn't all there, because it would be easier um, to train them on learning about the software, learning about the services, learning about the solution, learning about the challenges that are going to um, come across their way. Along, along with their um, technical work that they would be doing, that's yeah. that's where I think training can can be um, very beneficial. I I think I'm in alignment overall with that uh, uh, advice uh, because if the seventy percent role is leadership and management and accountability, uh, we in the U.S. world we call it LMA seat that you lead you manage the day-to-day -day mechanical side of the job, mm -hmm. and then you hold others accountable for their commitments. Oh, and like that. Uh, if that 70% is all influence, which is leader, you know, leadership, the way I define it at the end of the day is influence, just one word to define. 100%. Influence, right? So if that is the, that is the 70%, then if you get a mindset where they are people centric, they know how to influence people, and then they probably will be able to structure their division in a way mm -hmm. that they can have they can acquire an ability within the team to become that escalation point for thirty percent while knowing how to position people and who to hire and who to give that opportunity type exactly. of thing, how to structure things. and uh, when the behaviors required for that seventy percent is ambition and then influence, uh, you know, influence, uh, emotional uh, intelligence, uh, then it's it's uh, easy to teach people skills what we yeah. normally hear and what we kind of, mm -hmm. so it's easier to teach skills than mindset, and it's yeah. hard to teach someone that mindset of. Uh, 
uh, influence and uh, what it takes to really influence people. So I appreciate uh, your advice, your wisdom there, and thank you. Do you want to, you were about to say something there. No, I, I, I loved how you, you placed both of them in that, um, that changing someone's mindset is, is difficult, is definitely more difficult than, um, than their skill set, especially if it's technical skill set. I 100% agree. If someone has that leadership, has that mindset of um, helping people, they would tap into their talent in the team. They would know who's good at what and, and delegating the work that way too. Yeah. And uh, I want to go deeper into leadership potential because that's uh, that's a common struggle that how to identify that potential? How do you define that potential? What are the mindset and behaviors that you kind of need to look for to see that uh, uh, potential, right? So can you talk to me about what in a small business environment again and in the yes. context of... Uh, uh, a leader of technology professionals, uh, the example that I used, what, what's your advice to leaders to be able to define and then look for the potential talent, potential value? So um, especially for smaller organizations, I would say because they don't necessarily have um, the money to, to buy assessments like th for thousands of dollars, right? To assess leadership potential. So some of the work that I did for smaller organizations at that level, where even if they don't buy um, assessments that, that they can, that they can use throughout their, their department, if they can come, if they can draw a checklist, I would say some of the behaviors that I can provide this is based on empirical research. This is based on combining Corn Ferry Assessment, Harvard Business Review, every credible, any credible source that you can think of. Once, um, when I was looking at the data that they all had in common and some of the characteristics that they said, this is what makes, um, this is what you can observe in your candidate to see if they have leadership potential or not. The, the most common variable that we had was learning agility. And learning agility, what that is in very simpler terms is Sunny, whenever like someone goes through an experience, it's one thing, we all go through failures, we all go through experiences, but your ability to learn from those experiences and actually apply them into the future circumstance that you will have connected back to, oh, like, I remember that I went through this, 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 and this is the lesson that I learned and be, and be able to apply that. That's learning agility. That was one factor that every credible source um, on leadership potential assessment said that if someone shows high learning agility, that would be the biggest differentiator in your people. And some of the behavior characteristics I can, I can talk about with, uh, that are associated with high learning agility is Let's say if you have tasked um, your, whether it's a team lead or whether it's an individual contributor, if they, if you, if you're trying to see if they have high learning agility, I would say give them a problem and see if they are trying to seek alternatives, if they are um, challenging the status quo, if they are questioning things from a different perspective, if they look at others' views and see that how are other people approaching to a similar problem that they have. If they are observant that way. If they are willing and asking to take on any challenging assignments, right? They are the ones who would be finding innovative ways uh, to go uh, to solve a problem. They would be asking a lot of, what if this? What if I were to do this? What if, so a lot of what if questions you would notice in their in their day-to-day behaviors. Um, they would always be connecting choice and consequences that if I were to do this, then this would be the consequence that that shows that mindset that they have thought things through. They are not impulsive that way. They would, if you put them in a situation that they have never been in before, they're able to navigate it. They're able to quickly adapt and adjust um, their behavior, adjust their, um, their mindset quickly. I love that. I love that. Because uh, well, what I'm hearing you say is uh, all the things that entrepreneurs have to do. 
they need to figure <laughs> things out, right? So they got to be in a territory where they just don't know because no one have been there, done that. Yeah. And that's the territory that you need to explore uh, in terms of opportunities and avail those opportunities. Then you got to learn, you got to ask a lot of uh, what if questions, you got to kind of rethink, reimagine, and uh, believing in perspectives, believing in context and uh, the relevancy from one point to another point type of stuff. So I call it the uh, entrepreneurial leaders, uh, where mm. when you have those type of, uh, uh, you know, uh, abilities, uh, when you have those type of uh, behaviors, uh, that's your way of thinking. Uh, I love those people because uh, that's, uh, that's, that's the entrepreneurship. Uh, that is where you yeah. can figure things out, right? And, yeah. and then when you started with learning agility, I yeah. love that. I really, really love that because, you know, a lifelong learning uh, is really, really critical. It's really, really important, right? And because the when you have learning agility, in my view, that's where you kind of you can say that oh this person has growth mindset because that person is yeah. open to ideas that person is open to learn it's not my way or the highway or mm-hmm. i know everything they they have that self awareness that everyone uh, have blind spots and you can learn from others you can do you can transform yourself and also like when uh, i i shared this at build it for the first time uh, and people were asking me, Sunny, that you uh, came to this country in '93 to drive taxi, mm-hmm. and uh, and now you are a tech entrepreneur. So, what lesson? What do you think contributed to that success? That taxi to uh, mm. tech entrepreneurship. The journey that you had. The journey that uh, now the, the I drive Tesla, so some people were. <laughs> <laughs> I was taking them around on a taxi to Tesla journey. Sunny, what is that learning? And I, uh, I kind of, I shared this one word with them is that hunger to learn every day. Uh, learning from people around me that uh, you, you mentioned uh, less, you know, learning lessons from every single experience that you get. And uh, it's more uh, like in terms of, um, uh, in terms of experience learning, right? That you transform from your learning. What worked, what didn't work? What can mm-hmm. I do better? And how can and I learn that. to do better type of thing? So I'm like lifelong learning, man. Lifelong learning took me from taxi to Tesla. And uh, that is one thing that I, I think is the most critical, critical piece that I 100%. know that it contributed to my success and it can help a lot of other entrepreneurs, professionals, everyone on this earth. This earth will be a better place if we are all lifelong learners. And I love that when you say it, when you're like, oh, lifelong learning, learning agility, yeah, yeah. right? And this might be a little extreme, but I always felt if I'm not learning, I'm already dead. You know, like what, what really differentiates if, if I stop growing, if I stop learning, like how do I know that I'm still I'm I'm still alive biologically sure but but what kind of you know what kind of a life is that that's just my personal opinion yeah so I know you last time when we were uh, prepping for this call and you shared your journey as well from you know where you started to where you are right mm. now so the the you know the question that people asked me during our annual conference if I ask you the same question Amara that what is that one thing that contributed to your growth, your success? What is that? I would say never give up. That um, like lifelong learning, that's just, that's a given, right? Like I, I feel like I'm not alive if I'm not learning. But if there was one thing that I would say, um, and I started from such a different, I think you and I talked about it. I started from such a different background. I, 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 I came here when I, to this country when I was 18. Um, I was in the second year of medical school in Pakistan. And when I moved here, just a culture shock, just everything was so different, right? Coming from a different ethnicity and a religious background, just national origin, everything was so different. Yeah. And then starting over, um, completely changing my career. So there were a lot of struggles. 
But I think persistence and um, never wanting to give up because every failure teaches you something. Every you either win or you learn. There is there is nothing in between. Yeah. And what is that girl's name that was from? Uh, uh, like, you know, uh, I think she was from Afghanistan. Uh, uh, that girl who. Oh, uh, are you talking about Malala? Yeah, yeah. So, Malala, is, she's from Pakistan. Oh, she is. Oh, okay, yeah. So she is. Oh, yeah. She's from Pakistan. Yeah. She's so, also from. There Pakistan, is some relevancy yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, I think that you know, if we probably ask her the same question, uh, and I think uh, it 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 goes back to what you just said: is uh, never give up. Yeah, yeah. That, you either yeah. win or you learn. There is that. That's those are the only two options. Yeah. Yes. 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 No, I love that. So is that uh, learning agility? Uh, yeah. With that uh, never give up uh, type of approach or grit, uh, right? It's so another way to mm-hmm. probably say this, mm-hmm. this grit, learning with grit uh, can take yes. you to kind of places that you probably uh, did not never imagine. imagine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So coming back to our, uh, the, your three, uh, your, your model of uh, performance, multiplied by potential is equal mm-hmm. to readiness right it's not sum it's it's, it's a, not a sum mul- it's, yeah, a it's a multiplier because if if one is missing then the if then if one is missing then the end result is a zero it's it's not if it's a sum then one plus one could be a two or a zero plus one can be a one yeah. but if one of them is not there then then the end result is a zero I love that. And uh, is there anything else that you would like to share? Something that I missed uh, that that will help leaders cultivate their own talent in their small business environments, and they can give those you know the meaningful work to people. They can set up people for success because that's what normally uh, an entrepreneur wants, right? But sometimes that unconscious. Uh, bias to a lot of things mm-hmm. can end up making, you know, you end up making wrong decisions. Any other advice that you have for leaders to be successful with their uh, talents, uh, career development plans? One, I would say um, to your point for unconscious biases, and that is so much, you know, not just DEI, but so many different biases that we have. And they usually help us be successful, make quick and fast decisions, but they can also sometimes create blind spots for us. So to really educate ourselves and um, know where my own blind spots are, just be a little bit more self-aware. And secondly, I would say take Take the time to get to know your people, especially as a leader, help them understand what they want, what motivates them, what gets them excited, where is it that they find joy, what is the purpose that they're trying to fulfill in their day to day, and and help them get to that level, whether it's by creating that that path, their their career journey from where they start and where they go, be observant. If on a daily basis, you're looking at things that they're not doing so well, provide feedback, provide consistent feedback. Don't wait for the end of the year performance reviews um, to dog them on some of the things that they didn't. Oh, you weren't a good team player or you didn't do this right. And that's why I'm taking points off of your performance review, which is now going to affect your bonus or your increase in salary. Those things, they, they don't... They don't make you feel your people feel valued. They don't make you feel that may, they don't make them feel like you're investing. You're genuine. You have the best interests at heart for them. So, so just 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 be genuine and 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 take care of your people. Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, so with <clears throat> so with that, uh, it's a little bit more creating that environment, right? Where it, I think it aligns mm-hmm. with what you said earlier, inclusion. Uh, right, that people have that uh, psychological safety uh, yeah. that they can speak straight in those con, you know, in those meetings. They and they that the way in uh, way in buy in is uh, is there with you know with the team that they're able to speak straight. They're able. They feel that they are included in that de- decision making. Uh, critical uh, project mm-hmm. that they are contributing to, they are co-created uh, plans, 
and where mm-hmm. they feel heard, uh, right? So what's your advice for now, you know, the last uh, uh, question there is diversity and inclusion. Uh, what is your advice to leaders? Uh, what can they do? So something that from the actionable items point of view, uh, what can they do to get better with diversity and inclusion? So I can tell you what to do, but also like there is there are there are a couple of things that I notice a lot that business owners or leaders are doing that they think I think sometimes work, um, but not but as we notice um, within our client um, base or our prospects or partners, it doesn't necessarily. A lot of times, like we think creating a checklist of this is what needs to happen for our diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, initiative and once they start checking those boxes it feels good because it feels like you've accomplished something but it doesn't it's not effective at all since it is a people strategy it needs to be integrated into your overall business strategy and not just um that i've done this i did this i asked someone where they come from i have this quota of people that i've hired instead look at the people that you're the talent that you're bringing right don't and I'm not saying hire someone just because they represent a different group. They have to be, it has to be merit-based. They have to be qualified. But from selection, from marketing, from um, the vendors that you work with, it, diversity goes into so many different areas of, of your business than just um, having a committee and letting them do whatever they want on their own. So try to see how you can integrate that as an overall business strategy from how you hire people all the way to um, when you do business with your clients. What what is their strategy, right? So it has to be a part of all of that. And then understanding if your people feel included, do they feel like they belong? Because sense of belongingness, that's where... I think that's where most of us miss the mark. Most of us um, don't tap into if um, the people in your team, if the people in your conference room, if they feel like they they belong there. Because someone who has traveled to, as a leader of the the organization or as a team um, lead, if they have traveled to Sweden, if they have traveled to Australia and they come back and the meeting is being held within like, um, financial analyst or um, or a technical recruiter or someone at a front at a front or an entry level role. Now, hearing your VP's experiences about how they're traveling internationally, the food that they got to enjoy, all of those things, like I can't imagine the impact that it would it would you know how it would make others feel in that room because not everyone is at the same level. The same thing goes with having a good understanding if you have Muslims in your team or are they having a Ramadan going on? Do they have do they have special needs around their religious holidays or um, women in, in general? Right. So there's there's a lot of different areas. So not just the biggest mistake I see is that just creating a checklist and, and calling it a day that this is all we needed and we're, we're good to go. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so in terms of, I mean, overall, like, you know, so the overall, there's there's just so much power in diversity. Uh, This country is uh, built upon diversity. This company, uh, this country has done so well because of the power of diversity. And uh, we can just take that uh, success story and and apply that in our, uh, our, you know, companies, organizations as leaders to make sure that we are able to leverage uh, all strengths that are available, all unique strengths, unique abilities that we have available around us because of that diversity around us. And uh, yeah, so I love that. And thank you so much, uh, Amara. I truly, truly appreciate your time, your very, very valuable insights uh, and that you came here and shared with uh, me and my uh, community members, uh, ITBD community members, and the rest of the world. I truly appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. I always enjoy our partnership, so it's it's totally my pleasure. Thank you.
If you enjoyed this episode of Sunny's Silver Linings, please like, follow, and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any future episodes. We'll see you next week.